Ladies and gentlemen, this is Joe's Classic Video Games back with another cool pinball repair video for you this evening. We've been working on this airport for several weeks now, it seems like, on this channel. And uh, we've got a few things left, so hopefully we can get it finished up in this video. I may eat those words later, but I think this is the sixth video we've done on this game. It's a cool game, though, so nothing wrong with that. Uh, on the last video, we had finally gotten to the point where we had done everything under the playfield. Uh, we did a video on the top of the playfield. We did a video on the back box, I believe. We did a video on the mech board underneath. Uh, there was a, uh, I, there, I think there was another video where we were removing a bunch of hacked wires under the playfield. <laughs> so it's been, it's been busy. So uh, I think it's time to wire the flippers back up. Yeah, that's right, the flippers are unwired. On the previous video, we put a flipper rebuild kit in and we put new flipper bats on it. But they moved the flipper switches, which I've talked about about four times already in this video series. So let me flip up the play field and I'll show you what they did and then uh, I was hoping to put it back the way it originally was, but I can't find any parts for it. So I'll show you what I'm talking about. So the way it originally was wired is whenever you press the button, there was a little bracket mounted here with a little piece of wire that stuck out. And as you press the button, it would pre it would move a little piece of wire and it would make a little wire form move like that. And then there was one over here that I think went this way. <laughs> And what that would do is it would hit a switch on the playfield. There would be a switch there, and that little wire thing sticking out would line right up with it and would connect the switch together. There was one there, and then there was one up here. And if you have had those removed from your machine, you're not going to find any more easily. They do pop up from time to time, but not this time. So the way they had it set up... If I can slide this out of here without getting electro killed, was they moved the flipper switches down here. Now the reason they did that presumably was um, they like the idea of directly hitting the switch. Now this one, ironically, is adjusted so far apart it would have negated any of the benefit they were trying to get by moving the flippers, but whatever. So the thought process behind it is if you have direct contact with the flipper switch you can adjust it really close if I can get the bend to where you just barely hit it and it hits the flipper and they're very responsive if you had the little metal thing that it originally had if it was you know whenever you laid a play field down there may be a gap of that far between the metal thing and the switch and so you had to push the flipper and it has to move quite a bit before it hits the switch The easy way to fix that is to just bend the switch a little bit, like you bend all the other switches in the game. But for whatever reason, people like to go way out of their way to reinvent the wheel. And so, they soldered telephone wire. Or, is this... This must be Cat 1. They, they soldered this to the flippers. Now, you can see the problem. There's no way to remove the playfield with it like that, and you can't even set the playfield up like this with it like that. So when the customer brought it to me, one of these was already broken because it was already an issue even before anybody tried to fix it. So I'm going to rig this up even more. Um, ooh. Hmm. I've been trying to think of the best way to do it. I, I, there's no clean way to do this. I'm just going to do it. I'm going to half-ass it like they did because that's the choice they've left me. Um, if you had a Jones plug, you could add a Jones plug, wire this into the Jones plug, and then have the wires coming off of that run up onto the play field. Um, but I don't have a jo an extra Jones plug. I was just looking at that thinking, ooh, there's some, there's some extra sockets we could steal them and use it, but we don't really have... I need two of them. Yeah, I'm just going to put like a Molex connector on it. And then whenever they remove the play field, they can just remove the Molex connector. So we need to route these wires back to the back where the other wires from the play field plug in. 
and then we're going to put a connector and run the wires all the way up through the loom, all the way up to the top where they're, the wires for the flipper switches are supposed to be. So basically, instead of having it just short wired, hanging in the cabinet, we're going to route it through the cabinet, make it more clean, so that it, uh, the play field can still be removed with the wrong flipper switches on it. Okay, so I ran the wire over that way, and then down along this harness, and then it kind of has to go out in the middle. And I ran it over to the other flipper. And so by doing that, I can kind of join them together. Each one of these, whenever they used it, this, whatever this shielded cable is, it's got three wires in it actually, plus, so it's got black, red, and green. So I think what I'll do is I'll leave the, the black and green as that signal. And then they both get a ground, so one of them can be a ground. So this left one, I can hook the black to that black. And uh, that way we're just running a black wire back for the, the, I'm calling it the ground, but one side of the transformer. And then the red wire, I can hook to the other red wire. And then that way we've got all three of our lines that we need running down the one cord to the back. I would have to switch this wire from the green one to the red one. So from here over we'll have a red wire and a black wire that come across and then the black wire joins the other black wire and runs back. The red wire joins the other red wire and runs back and the green wire from here runs back. So we'll have three of them running to the back of the machine. So then I ran it under the knocker there and I used a little cable clamp to keep it off of this bell because if the wire is hanging down and touching the bell it might change the way it sounds whenever you get your beautiful ding, you know, whenever you score a point. <laughs> so I ran the one wire all along that and that will get us back to the Jones plugs back there. Alright folks, so I ran the wire back so we have three wires, a red one, which is the left flipper, a green one, which is the right flipper, and a black one, which is the common to them. Okay, so that wire is coming out here. The red and the green are going into a Molex. The black one I have been able to solder on the bottom of this Jones plug inside the cabinet uh, because that wire that goes up onto the play field connects right there so you don't have to actually run it all the way up onto the play field. And so I've got the red and the green that need to run to the flippers in this Molex and then coming out the other side I've got them going down the uh, wiring harness up onto the play field and I tried to kind of hide it. This abomination. I didn't do this. By the way I just want to be really clear. I had nothing to do with this. This is how it was found. Someone else did this in antiquity. So when they disconnect those three plugs, they ought to be able to see that fourth plug and disconnect it too. And then it comes around here. Oh, I didn't notice I got it wrapped around at one time. So you can kind of see it there for, I don't know, you know, but I did the best I could. And then it comes up through here. Got it back behind there. I put it behind the loom, trying to hide this crap. <laughs> People, I'm just playing around. It's not that big of a deal, but, you know, it's funny. Um... And it comes up here, and then I just connected it straight to the flippers. Now, this is the wire that went up here originally. I just left it. I was going to run that wire up there and just tie it to the end, but actually it's easier, and the wire wasn't long enough, so I just, bam, right to the flippers. So, that should actually make our flippers work, finally. You know, they've never worked. Even whenever uh, the gentleman dropped it off to us, one of the wires was broke. So it wouldn't have worked even if we tried it back then. Um, and this down here ended up looking pretty clean. Uh, and I vacuumed everything out again. So what, I love, this would be a good time to mention this as well. On a pinball machine, see how we've got the wire right now and it's just hanging down and touching these relays? That's bad. Don't do that. Now, we kind of have to do it like that right now because the the way the play field is. But when you mount that play field back in there, the last thing you want to do is push those wires out of the way. 
because if they hang down on these relays, they'll make them stick open or stick closed or bend a, a uh, switch or something, and it just causes all kinds of problems. It doesn't help either that usually the like the tilt and the the uh, um, hold and all of those relays that are very important to every single thing running on the game. A lot of times they're the last relay back there. So whenever you lay the playfield down, look at your wiring harness and make sure it's out of the way. A lot of machines have a hook on the back wall back there. There'll be a hook that you like wrap the wire around to hook it in place because of that. And um, sometimes if you twist the, so you've got a cord with three plugs on it, sometimes if you twist the cord one time and then plug it in, it'll keep it up out of the way or it'll make it where it lays this way or that way whenever you put the play field down and it helps you out a little bit. Okay, so we got the flippers right. I think everything under the play field's fine. Um, next thing I'm going to do, this is going to be pretty quick, but I've got, I ordered the gentleman new springs and a new plate for this. Um, he's going to do all the cosmetic stuff really on the outside, but that's so rusted. I hate to leave it like that. And I was already ordering this stuff, so I just got him one while I was at it. And then also, these two inserts are pretty screwed up. So, um, I don't even know what's going on with that. So I ordered those new too. This is all pretty inexpensive stuff. So I'm going to take this off, replace those. And I'm going to take this out and make that look a lot better. All right, so I cleaned it up a little bit, got a little bit of the rust off, took the old ones out, put the new ones in. That really helps, I think. And those are not very expensive, so um, I got those at the Pinball Resource. I've said it before, they don't pay me anything. I don't even really know them guys. I just buy a bunch of stuff from them. They, that's the best company in the world. All they've ever given me is good service and good prices. So if you need pinball parts, go there. There's other places that sell this same type of stuff for these older EMs, but I think they just all buy them from the pinball resource and raise the price a little bit. Um, so I think that really, really, really made a big improvement just that. Okay, so now we're going to do the shooter rod. This one's seen better days. So there's the old one. You, know, you can see we've been as we've been working through this machine. Obviously, it was around a lot of moisture at some point, stored in a basement for a long time, probably. But that's fine. Um, and then this plunger, the end of it is starting to mushroom just a little bit. What probably happened was the rubber tip on the end of it broke at some point, and then it, they kept hitting the ball with it. That'll smash up the tip of it. So what I do is I've got a huge file. Then I just run it down the very edge of it, the corner, the like at a 45 degree angle on the end, just to clean it up. Um, this one isn't bad enough that it won't come out of the uh, sleeve there, but um, it's pretty. It's starting to get there, so I'm gonna clean it up a little bit with a file. So I have this big old, pretty rough file, and you just run it down it at an angle, and it rounds it back off. Right, just cleans it up, and you just do it until you it, it feels smooth, and it's pretty smooth now. And it took like a minute, something like that, like 60 seconds, so real quick. And uh, that should save it. And now a little rubber boot goes on it, of course, anyways. The only reason you're doing that is just trying to reform the tip where it won't go through the nylon sleeve very easily. But once you get it in the machine, it's never going to do that anyway because it's back here. Right, but uh, that's that. So the coin door still has rust on it. Um, that can be cleaned up pretty easy. That looks good. And the shooter rod looks a heck of a lot better. Now there is a lot of adjustment on these shooter rods. If you loosen those two screws on the back, you can move that thing all over the place, tilt it, all kinds of stuff. So uh, you may have to readjust it after you put the play field down to make sure that it's gonna line up with the center of the ball. You know, so you get a nice shot on it. Oh, and I, I always put one drop of oil on this. Now, it's going through nylon. Usually, I don't oil anything that's metal touching nylon. But on the shooter rod, I make an exception. It seems to make it just much nicer. So that's that. And you can see that the 
new rubber tip went over and made it all nice and new again. Very cool. So we got all that done. I just think that uh, I hated to leave it the way it was. It's just pretty ugly. Um, I guess we're ready to try to play it. I've still got to clean the score reels. And when I do that, I also need to clean the back glass, decide if we need to clear coat it, um, and replace the bulbs in the back box. So we got to mess with that a little bit. Uh, but it's about time to play it and just see if the flippers work and see what needs attention. All right, folks, I have made a list. This is my chicken scratch. I'm not going to expect you to uh, decipher that. I've got the schematics here we're going to look at because there's uh, some really cool stuff that this thing is doing. I want to show you, and I try to do this as often as possible, I want to show you some of the brilliance of these early designs. Now, these electromechanical pinball machines have relays and switches and everything's on and off. And then there's a, a uh, you know, a relay can lock on and can lock off. They can do things like that. Uh, and the score motor turns. But there's no computer here other than that this is actually the beginnings of a computer. So uh, we're going to look at some of these schematics. Now these schematics I have purchased from uh, the Pinball Resource. The Pinball Resource is a great company. They, they provide... Uh, copies of these uh, under license from Gottlieb and uh, they don't own Gottlieb they just have the license to create schematics and parts and things like that so if you need any of these schematics and, and for any machine for a Bally, a Williams, a Gottlieb, a, even the older stuff the real, I was, <laughs> they're all older stuff but I was thinking of like the games by exhibit and stuff like that uh, this is the place to get them this is the best pinball place in my opinion um, so it says right here, no further reproduction permitted. The uh, they basically Gottlieb protects their copyright, so that's why you're not going to find Gottlieb schematics on the internet. Now, if you bought the machine, it originally came with the set. If you've lost your set or it's been misplaced over the years, if you get in touch with these people, they'll make you a nice copy, and it's on full size paper, just like the originals, and they're like fifteen bucks or something like that well worth the money okay so I'm gonna show you an interesting little design that they have built into this game and a whole bunch of other games like it um, it's how they control the different scoring on the machine so let me show you on the play field what I'm talking about so here is the beautiful play field of our machine now they are all of these little feature lights so see how this says 10 times value when lit. Now, one of these, maybe this, see how that bounces back and forth? I think we looked at that on a previous video. They're doing that with the match unit. Okay, so that's easy. But if you look, none of the other ones work like that. See how nothing's moving? What a beautiful game. I've been swearing this was a beautiful game since uh, we started. But look what I've got lit up right now. This says 10 points or 100 points when lit, and it's lit. This one says 10 points or 100 points when lit, it's lit. This says 50 points or 300 points when lit, it's lit. This says 50 points or 300 points when lit, it's lit. This says 10 points when lit, 10 points when lit, 10 points when lit, 100 points when lit, 100 points when lit, or 10 points or 100 points when lit, 10 points or 100 points when lit, that light keeps bothering me. I gotta mess with that light. Okay, and then up here it says 50 points or 300 points when lit, and right now, this one's lit, this one is not lit, this one's lit, this one's lit, this one is not lit, and this one is lit. So, it's not always like that. Um, at certain times, different things... Oh, we have one in the middle here that says 50 points or when lit, 300 points. So, that you've got all of these lights on the play field uh, that are feature lights, they call it, uh, that turn on and off. And there's no computer to turn them on and off. So, how in the world are they doing that? The way they're doing that is they're using relays like art. That's how they're doing it. <laughs> so if you, if you 
get to the point where you can read the schematics and kind of track down what's going on with them, this stuff really starts blowing your mind. You'll get such a deep appreciation for how smart the, the early engineers were that did this stuff. Now, this was in the 60s, but if you think about it, that's like, what, 60 years after electricity was widespread used, <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's been another 55 years since then. You know what I mean? We're kind of new in this whenever they're designing this. So this is this is like pinball uh, uh, with no brakes. You know what I mean? Everybody everybody likes the the new ones and everything because they see these and they go, ah, it's just a flat play field. Uh, there's not much going on. The hell there isn't much going on. There's a lot going on. There's no computer to make any of it go on. It's all on and off switches and a motor that can turn around and to hit some switches and then stop, right? So I'm going to show you on the schematics how they're turning all of those lights on and off and how they've designed it. It's really simple. It's not that big of a deal. If you're into software design, you'll see the, the basics and the root of software design in the relays that they used in this machine. And it, it's mind-blowing whenever you really start to understand what they were doing. So the, the first thing you have to realize is that this stuff was progressive. So it started out where the machines had no power and then they put batteries in them to turn some lights on and then you know so it, it eventually they added the flippers they added a pop bumper to it uh, they added a flipper to it so each machine would kind of build on the previous machine so it wasn't just like one guy thought of all of this it was one guy took the last guy's stuff and added a little more you know and it crept up right so the way they are doing that is with the ball count unit, but in a creative way. So it depends on what ball you're on. So up here is the ball count unit. Okay. Um, how does it get power? Okay. So whenever the motor is not moving, power is connected from this side of the transformer through this switch that's closed on the motor. So if the motor is not moving, that switch is closed because it's at the home position. This is, everything is drawn uh, with everything, with the motor at least, in the, at the home position. Okay, so the power is connecting through here and then these lines represent connections, right? And so they have the ball count unit. On the ball count unit, there are little rivets. There's one at 0, 2, 4, 6, and 8. That's the position of the spider on the ball count unit. If you're at position 0, you are at ball 1, player 1. Now, if it's a two-player game, the ball count unit will move up one position to the, the first rivet, and it will be at ball 1, player 2. When it gets to the second rivet or the, the two position, it is at ball two, player one. Three would be ball two, player two. Four is ball three, player one. Five would be ball three, player two. Six is ball four, player one. Seven would be ball two, I mean, uh, ball four, player two. Eight would be ball one, uh, ball five, player one, and position nine would be ball five, player two. So zero, two, four, six, eight. They are showing you ball one, two, three, four, five, for player one. And because of the way the machine is designed, it only cares about when it first gets to ball one, when it first gets to ball two, first gets to ball three, first gets to ball four, and first gets to ball five, because it's going to set up the play field in such a way that it will hold over for player one or player two. So it will do something here at ball one on player one, and then it will stay that way for ball one, player two. I mean, ball two, player two. After ball two ends, it will step up to ball three, and it will do something else right here at position four on this. Uh, and then it will stay that way for ball three, player two. And so each time it does it, it's doing it as the ball changes, and then either one or two players plays with the play field set up like that. So it has these connections to this wire permanently added to the zero rivet and the 
four rivet, right? Or I'm sorry, I've got this all wrong. It's got it's got those wires permanently added to the spider. These little arrows are showing you a finger on the spider, right? And uh, interestingly enough, they're showing you two of them. Hmm. I wonder why there are two of them. I haven't thought of that yet. But basically, the power is connected to the spider, and then it's going to be touching a rivet, and depending on what position it is, different rivets. So here's the ball count unit. Now, this is different than some Gottlieb's. This is from 1969. Um, so basically, one coil can turn it one way, one coil can turn it another way. On the later, like, player units, it, they would just turn in one direction. But you can see all of the rivets, right? And then you can see these little feet here that are attached to different things. And as this thing turns, these are going to touch different rivets, which is going to connect power this way and that way and make different things happen, right? So uh, this is what they are showing in that little drawing. So here's what happens. We start at ball one and nothing happens. But whenever we get to ball two, power connects through that little disc we were just looking at. I said finger earlier. Some of them have a little octopus looking thing on it. That one's a disc. Uh, it, power will connect through and it will, since it'll be on rivet number two, power will connect through here and trip. Uh, it will go through this switch on relay 2D that is closed and will trip the relay 2B. Now when 2B trips, this switch will open, which will keep the power, which is still connected, from burning up the relay, right? So it gives it power just long enough to trip it, that relay falls, it's on a relay bank, and it will open up this switch. Now when it does that, it will close this switch, right? So when this little arrow here at ball one was on this line, this relay did not trip because the switch at 2B was open. So until that one trips, this one cannot be tripped. Now why did they do that? Right? If they didn't have that second thing there that I was talking about, they wouldn't even need that. Right? They could just go through them and they would trip as it gets to it. It's because of the three ball or the five ball thing. So you see this little thing here. Notice how the power connects up, the same power that goes to here, connects up over here to this little three rivet. This is on the three and five ball adjustment jack. So if you're set on ball number, if you're set on five balls per game, there's a little jack you can move inside of it. This will be connected here. But if you turn it on three, this line will connect to here. Well, what does that mean? That means that when you're on ball zero or any ball, power will come through here, through here, and wham, trip 2B. So right at the beginning of the game, this one will trip if you're on three ball. Now when that trips, it will connect that switch. And then what will happen? Well, you've got power connected here too. Wham, and it'll trip 3B. Oh my God, right at the beginning of the game. So then 3B trips and closes that. This at ball one will be there. At ball two, this actual connection will be there, right? So that line will trip this one. Wham! And then it, this switch closes. And then when it gets to ball three, which is the last ball in a three ball game, this this line up here will still be up here, but this line here will be down here, and it will trip 5B. So in a five ball game, this is not connected. You have ball one. When you get to ball two, it trips 2B. When you get to ball three, it trips 3B. When you get to ball four, it trips 4B. And when you get to ball five, it trips 5B. In a three ball game, this is connected. So on ball one, which we'll ignore this up here, on this would be ball one on a three ball game. 2B and 3B have already tripped. When you get to ball two, 4B will trip. And when you get to ball three, 5B will trip.
Now, why are they doing all of that? This is how they're controlling all of those lights. So that's pretty cool. That's pretty smart. But you ain't seen nothing yet. Let me show you how they have wired these things up. Now, one of the things you have to understand about how these are designed is whenever there's like a play field feature, there is a light that comes on that you see, but there's also a switch that makes the scoring happen. I call it the math side of it. So this is the math side of it. We're not really going to get into that, but you can see here that 2B, if it's not tripped, this wire is connected. If 2B trips, then this wire is connected, and this wire is no longer connected. Same with 4B, 5B, 3B. So there's all kinds of this on the schematics, and, um, and this is the area we were just looking at. So this, this does all kinds of stuff, right? But let's focus on the lamps, because it's the easiest to understand. If you see what the light is doing, you can assume that uh, what the math is doing, okay? So here is a section of it where it shows the lights. So this is power to light a lamp, and this is the neutral to light a lamp. Okay, so if the score motor is not turning, now keep in mind, if the score motor starts turning, all of these lights are going to turn off while that switch is open. I always thought that was weird, but they do that on purpose. You can see that they have specifically put a switch in there that will open every time the motor starts turning. So all of the lights turn off. Okay, and QB, I think that is the last uh, game over relay, I believe. So if the game is not over and the score motor is not turning, power will connect through here. And then if we're on ball one, that means that 2B hasn't fallen yet. 3B hasn't fallen, so power will connect through there. Okay, and 2B has not been tripped yet, so power will connect, and it will light up the number one ball in play light. All of these lights are connected to the neutral on one side. So if nothing's, if you're on ball one, the number one ball in play light gets power. You can see it right there. But also they have another wire connected that makes the number four rollover light light up. That's the one at the top of the play field that says 300 points when lit. So that's ball one. Power also would connect here, but since 2B isn't tripped and 3B isn't tripped, it wouldn't go anywhere. So that's all that would happen on ball one. Okay, so then you get to ball number two. And what happens when you get to ball number two? Well, you saw they have designed it so that 2B trips, the relay 2B. So if the relay 2B trips, then that means that ball, the number one ball in play light would no longer be connected. And now the number three rollover light would be connected. Now remember the number four rollover light is already turned on. So on ball two, the number four rollover light is going to be on and the number three rollover light is going to be on. Well, what about the ball in play number two light? Well, they got this little thing over here. <laughs> right? Now that 2B has dropped, this is connected. And power is going to the number two ball in play light. And also to the yellow pop bumper light. So now on ball two, let me look at my notes here. I made notes of all of this. On ball two, the number four rollover, the number three rollover, the number two ball in play, and the yellow pot bumper are lit up. Now, the number one light has turned off because this has turned, right? <laughs> but all of this stuff is on except for the number one light. Okay? So now we get to ball number three. So if you remember, on ball number three, the 3B three relay pulls in. So that's going to make this trip right here. Well, now you're no longer getting power over here, so none of this can light up. So number four is going to turn off. The number one ball and play light has been off because of the 2B being off. And the number three rollover light is going to be off. Right? So this is connected down to here now. So when the power comes through, it's going to get there and not do anything. But it's still connected here. So it comes down, and 2B has dropped. Now remember, once they fall, they stay fallen. So 2B has dropped, so the power is still coming through here. So the yellow pop bumper light will still be on. But the number 2 ball in play light will be turned off because 3B came on. So power will come through here. Yellow pop bumper light will stay on. 3B has tripped. So now the bottom red target light, the little stand-up, will be on. And there's two of them, so that one will be on as well. Power will connect down through here. And since 4B hasn't dropped yet, power will head this way. 
and turn on the number two rollover light, the number five rollover light, and the number three ball and play light. So if you didn't catch all that, you can clearly see the way they've designed this, that on ball number three, the number two rollover, the number five rollover, the number three ball and play, the yellow pop bumper, and both bottom red targets will be lit up. Sure as you're born. Okay, so when they get to ball number four, right, <laughs> this one will trip. Okay, so that means power will come through here, go through here. 2B is already tripped, so the yellow pop bumper light will be on. Uh, 3B has tripped, so this one will be off. The bottom two red target lights will be on. And now 4B is tripped, so none of these will be on, but the number one rollover light will be on. The number six rollover light will be on. The bottom left rollover light will be on. That was the 300 points when lit. Uh, the second bottom rollover light will be on. The left blue pop bumper light will be on, and the right blue pop bumper light will be on. Now, also, this one is connected because 5B hasn't tripped yet, which means that the number four ball and play light will be on. So if you didn't catch all that, on ball when, when you get to ball four, the number one light rollover, the number six rollover, the number four ball and play light, the yellow pop bumper, the bottom red targets, both of the bottom rollovers, and both of the blue pop bumpers will all be turned on. And all of the math to make all of that work will be turned on. So when you get to ball number five, they just start clowning on us. Okay? So when you get to ball number five, five B trips. Well, what that means is power comes through here. Two B is tripped. So the yellow pop bumper light is on. This one is tripped. So the bottom red target light is on. The other bottom red target is light is on. This one is tripped. So the uh, number one rollover light is on. The number six rollover light is on. The bottom left rollover light is on. The bottom right rollover light is on. The left blue pop bumper is on. The right blue pop bumper is on. And now that this is tripped, the number five ball and play light is on. The top red stand-up target on the left is on. The top red tar stand-up target on the right is on. The 300 points when lit light in the middle of the play field is on. And the red pop bumper light is on. But at the same time, just for the hell of it, they connected another little wire over here that comes back up here, back through 3B that they tripped earlier, right? <laughs> 2B has was tripped earlier, so it lights back up the number 3 rollover light and the number 4 rollover light. And these don't have much going on. Okay, so I'm still working through it, but here is ball 1. You've got this 10 times value in lit that goes back and forth that we looked at earlier. Um, and then up here at the top, it's ball one, so only the number four rollover is lit. I don't have the, the uh, bell ringing yet. Okay. So, that's ball one. We'll end ball one. This is ball two. Okay, so you heard it go click, click. That was the ball count unit stepping up two positions. Here come the police. Go get them. I'm behind you. I'm with you all the way. So it's ball two. So now number three and number four are one. Also, our yellow pop bumper light is on. Right? So now whenever you hit the same one, I don't know why it's doing that, but you heard. Right? So that's ball number two. So ball number three... You heard the click, click, ball number three. So it went click, click, that tripped 3B, which if you remember, turns on light number three. It also turns on the, the bottom two red targets, it said. Right? It leaves on the yellow pop bumper. It turns these two off and then turns these two on. So now when I hit this one, it gives me 50. I don't know why that's buzzing. I'm keeping a list of everything that I need to look at. That's, that's what we're doing. We're troubleshooting. Um, so that's ball number three. Right? Click, click, and then the light. Because the click, click is what turns on 4B, right? So 4B leaves the two right. We'll hit the flipper. 
Our flippers are working, by the way. It leaves the two bottom right, tar the bottom red targets on, but now it's turned on the two bottom rollovers. It leaves the yellow pop bumper on, but now it's turned on both of the two blue pop bumpers. And now it's turned off, two and three are still off. I mean, uh, three and four are still off. One and five are now off. Three and four are still off. Two and five are now off. One and six are on. Right? Ball four. So. Right? And these are properly scoring. So 10, 10, and this one's 10 because it's 100 when lit. So all of this is doing its thing, right? If I can get the ball out. It's ball four. So you heard click, click, and then it's moved, right? So now we've got the full complement. We've got the two bottom rollovers are still on. The two bottom red targets are still on. The yellow pop bumper is still on. The two blue pop bumpers are still on. The red pop bumper is on. Now the two top red stand-ups are on. And one and six are still on, but it went ahead and added three and four back on with that little wire that we were looking at. That's just art. What a creative way to do all that. Freaking awesome. And they did all of that with switches. Okay, so let me show you something that you don't see too often, but it is always something you need to look for. So I'm tracking down why the bell isn't ringing for the 100 points. And uh, this wire broke loose while I was messing with it. So that may have been a problem. So this switch right here, when this is the 100 point relay, L, relay L, Whenever this pulls in, one of the things it does is it closes this switch. Right? So one of the wires is now broke off, so that's certainly a problem. We're going to put that back on, but there's another problem. And you see this from time to time, but I've never got a good video of it. You see the issue. The contact has came loose from the actual switchblade. So what this is an extreme example. So what's going on is it's no longer electrically connected to this switchblade. So if this relay pulls in, the contacts are touching, but since that one has came loose from the blade, it's no longer going to send power through it. It probably sends power from this contact to this contact, but then this contact is just press fitted into these little blades. So if that press fitting has came loose, it's not going to work. So that was probably the issue. I broke that wire off when I was over here messing with it. So that's probably the issue. So the way you fix it is uh, you put a bunch of solder on it. Not that big of a deal. Alright, so I just threw some solder on it. Push the thing up in there, let the solder melt, and wham, it's good now. What you want to do, if you ever get one where you think, man, it's got to be that switch, and you can't tell, just look at it and try to spin that little contact. If that contact will spin around in the blade, it's probably not making contact. So, uh, yeah. So hopefully that'll get a bell working again. So this is our 10-point bell. We already played with it on an earlier video. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Now, you wanted a 100-point bell, huh? Well, there you go. You said you wanted it. What's the problem? All right, folks, so I've put the bulbs in the, the back box. Now, we're going to see if our match unit is properly lighting up all of the match numbers. Five, four, three, two. One, blast off. Zero, nine, eight, seven, six, five. That's interesting that on this one, although they're in reverse order, it's just doing them in order. On uh, a lot of the Bally's, 
and maybe Gottlieb did this eventually too, it would do them, they just moved the wires around a little bit. So it would do like two, eight, three, seven, four, one, five, zero. Uh, just, uh, I don't know that you would, I guess you could probably keep track of it if you figured out how it worked, you know. Because basically, you don't want anybody guessing what the match number is before the end of the game. Because then you could just make sure that your point adds up and lose the ball and get a free game. You'd have to be pretty skilled to do that. But you'd have to count the, the pattern, right? Um, so yeah, so like if it's on 5, I guess you could still do it if you counted it and made sure that it was always a number of 10. So if you were that good, you could just get, I don't know if that would work. But you might be able to game it if it's linear like that. So maybe somebody could back in the day. Maybe somebody was good enough that they could count how many steps the match unit must have moved and win a free game. So I have done all the score reels. Let's see if they will reset. Hopefully. If not, I'll fix it. Look at this. That one doubled up. But that's all right. That's all right. It got there. It don't have to do it the first. People, it's all right if it does it the second. If it did it the first, if it, we don't even know that anything's, I'm, le I'm leaving it. I'm not. All right, folks. What a beautiful game. I'm going to play a game. I think we're pretty good, pretty well off on it. Uh, one thing I've noticed is sometimes when you run through and the 300 points, it buzzes. Some kind of coil is buzzing, but it scores right and everything plays right. And it doesn't always do it, so I'm not really sure what that is. But uh, whatever. Um, also, the glass has a really bad scratch on it up here. So the customer may end up ordering a new sheet of glass. It's fine. It just kind of, it's obvious. Like, you can see it. It just had the crap scratched out of it somehow. Uh, everything seems pretty good. It plays fun. The flippers are pretty strong. Our buddy Matt was just saying he knocked it all the way to the top with the little tiny flippers, and he had never seen that happen before. Um, the very targets seem to be working properly. So I think we're pretty good. Ball one. The bell is loud. The other one. The hundred point one. You'll hear it. It's coming. Oh, they're stealing it from me. I'd like to hit one of the very targets so you can see how they work. got a I think the 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 five B <laughs> that's crazy I think the five B coil 
is doing something weird. You see how the light was going on and off? It shouldn't really be doing that. Okay, I got 2,000 points even that time. Playing itself, folks. Oh. <laughs> Come on. 1,536 points. I think it's letting me do ball four again. What's up with that? and 50 points. One more time. Ooh. Slid it right by me. I got 10 points, 100 points. <laughs> All right, 3,390 points. That's a pretty high scoring game. So there you go, folks.
very fun looks great it's fantastic beautiful turned out nice so leave your comments below let us know what you think i like the little quarter things too let us know what you think make sure to give us a thumbs up for taking the trouble to film it for you we didn't have to do that make sure to check out our new channel uh, amateur repair time the link is down below that's where i fix radios and clocks and things like that if you enjoy that kind of content go check that out uh, and f last but not least don't forget to check out my brother donnie my brother has his own channel here on youtube uh, he has uh, we, he works on old buildings old vehicles and has a farm so cows and goats are involved so go check that out i'm over there with him on that channel a lot uh, but we will see you back here in a couple days with another series that will begin or we'll probably do an arcade game video so we'll see you next week with an arcade game video i'll see you sunday for amateur repair time and i will see you tuesday for an arcade video this is gatlib's beautiful airport <laughs>